bit about how you heal the man with the withered hand. Open blinded eyes made lame walk again. His miracle, there is no doubt, is how you cleanse my soul from every sinful stain. I've been born again. Welcome to South, South Ashburg Church of God. Good to see each of your faces. Good to be in God's house. Amen. Um, thankful for those watching online uh, and for those here present in the sanctuary. Um, looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us today. Um, looking forward to having church with each and every one of you. Let's all stand together and ask for the Lord's help on this service. Uh, every part of it. We just want to be Him. Want Him to be the center of it. His will to be done. Let's call on Him together and ask for His blessings. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you all for your all around yeah, Lord Jesus, you're so good to us, God. We thank you, God, for being Lord Jesus, to be in your house yet again, Lord. Thank you for your strength and help, Lord, your provision, God. Thank you for each and every one that's here, Lord. We thank you most of all for your presence, Lord. We thank you, Holy Ghost, that you would touch every teacher, Lord, touch every student, Lord.
did. We'll ask our ushers to come to receive our penny march, and then they'll come back through and do the Sunday school offering. Good angels all around you. teachers you can take charge of your classes those of you remaining in, a, in the adult class can turn with me to the book of Micah chapter 7 Micah is just after the book of Jonah a short seven chapters Micah will be in the seventh chapter we're going to be reading verses 1 through 8 Chapter 7, Micah 7, 1 through 8. Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the seven, se summer fruits as the grape gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desireth the first ripe fruit. The good men is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net that they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asketh, and the judge asketh for a reward. And the great man, he uttereth his mischievous desire, so they wrap it up. The best of them is as a briar, the most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. The day of thy watchman and thy visitation cometh. Now shall, their shall be their perplexity. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a God. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter rises up, riseth up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy, when I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Our focus is on verses 7 and 8. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. The title of our lesson today is Get Up. Micah, a minor prophet of the Old Testament. We know that minor does not mean minor as in their ministries were less than the major prophets, just their ministries may have been shorter. Their books, of course, are shorter. So therefore, they're categorized there together, many of them, in that latter portion of the Old Testament as being the minor prophets. This minor prophet, Micah, he lived in a small town about 25 miles southwest of the city of Jerusalem. The prophet Isaiah lived at the same time and ministered at the same time. And while Isaiah was addressing his message to the king of Judah and to international situations, Micah was what you would call a country preacher. He was a country prophet, preaching and prophesying against Judah's corrupt leaders, false prophets, ungodly priests, dishonest merchants, and bribed judges. 
He preached against all types of sin, and he predicted the fall of the nation of Israel, both parts of that. Life in the Spirit uh, Bible note says, Micah laments the corruption of the society in which he lived. We, can, we read some of that. He's lamenting that corruption, violence, dishonesty, and immorality ran rampant in Israel. These are God's people. Few people were really godly. We read that. Family and family love had nearly disappeared. We read that as well. Leaders outside and inside the church were corrupt and following their own way. Even storekeepers were in on the action. Knowing that Micah penned these words in the midst of the troublesome and perilous times of his day gives us every right to embrace these same words as our own in today's world. That's what makes God's word alive. Amen? It is living. It doesn't have to have a time or a place to be relevant or to make sense. You open it today and read it, just like your parents, hopefully, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, and further down the line did, and it still fits. It still works. It never changes, and it is everlasting. The Bible says in Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever, and is not Jesus the Word. Amen? So our troublesome days, though, they, though they're here in 2022, can be seen in this prophet's address there in the just over 700 years before Jesus was born. This is when Micah is living, prophesying even of Jesus' birth, 700 years before he, he arrived. That's a long time ago, right? And though Micah addressed the masses, he makes a very personal proclamation to the Lord in verse 7 and a very bold declaration to his enemy, his adversary, in verse 8. If you will look with me at verse 7, it's, he's, it begins with the word therefore, and he's basically saying because of all this, everything that we read before that, because all this corruption is going on, in that verse, therefore, he's going to do two things. If you look at that verse, I will do two things. The first thing is, I will look unto the Lord. Micah made a definite decision that his focus was not going to be on, on all the sad, corrupt wickedness around him. He says, I'm not going to get caught up in watching or looking at those who take hold of evil with both hands diligently, or at the son dishonoring his father, or those who hold office that take bribes. I'm not going to get my eyes on the other prophets or priests of my day who are leading people astray. He said, even though all these things are happening, my eyes, mine eyes will look unto the hills. Right. Psalm 121, 1 through 2, I'll lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Amen. Right. Micah said, my physical eyesight will take a backseat to my spiritual eyesight, for we walk by faith not by sight. That's 2 Corinthians 5 and 7. It matters what you look at naturally. I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes, right? And it matters what you look at spiritually. Now more than ever, we must make a firm commitment to keep our eyes on Jesus. While the world around us pursues, heavily pursues ungodliness, they take hold of wicked with both hands and do it diligently, just like they did in Micah's day. Uh, while people seek after their own interests, their own gods, and their own lust, we as children of God have to make a determined effort to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The second thing Micah said he would do, he said, I will wait for the God of my salvation. Waiting on God has many benefits, uh, such as uh, what is mentioned in Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The Amplified Bible says of that verse, but those who wait for the Lord, who expect, look for, and hope in him, shall change and renew their strength and power. They shall lift their wings and mount up close to God. Amen. As eagles mount up to the sun. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint or become tired. I like being able to mount up close to God, don't you? I like being able to run this race without getting weary or tired. And if waiting has to be involved in order for me to have such benefits, then so be it. While things are evil all around us, our eyes are on Jesus and our expectation is from him. I mean, who else can make good out of all this evil? Who else can be trusted to keep our lives intact? 
our souls at rest, and our minds at peace. Who else but God? We wait just as Micah did for something to change, for answers to come from the only source. Micah, as moved on by the Holy Ghost to pen these words, assigns himself to task while the world around him falls apart. He says, I will look to God and I will wait on him. This sounds like an excellent route to take. This sounds really like the only way to go. How can we go wrong by looking to God and waiting for him? I encourage you to make these two simple tasks your life's commitments or your life's recommitments. Looking to God, waiting on God. Nothing profound there. It's just simple basics. Christianity 101. Then after Micah says, I will do two things, in that same verse, he says, God will do one. He says, I'm going to look unto Jesus, right? I'm going to wait on him. And then God's assignment and what God's going to do is the latter portion of verse 6. He says, he will hear me. The God which made heaven and earth, the God who the Bible says, he stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. He takes notice of my cries, of your cries. He's not too busy or too overwhelmed. He actually wants to hear from me, from you. And Micah says, in all my efforts, I am met with a priceless reward. He hears me. Three simple words, profound, awesome. He hears me. Psalm 18 and 6, I'm going to read you the amplified version of that. He says, in my distress, when seemingly closed in. Have you ever felt that way? In my distress, when seemingly closed in, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. Who else do we have? Where, should we, where can we go, right? He heard my voice out of his temple, his holy dwelling place, and my cry came before him into his very ears. 1 John 5 and 14, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. We all at times, no matter our ages, our situations, our family relationships, have moments when we think no one is listening to us. I need y'all to believe, yes. We all have those moments, right? We think nobody's listening. No one is concerned about what I'm feeling or what I need to talk about. But God is never that way. Praise the Lord. His ear is always available to his own. And I know that's simple teaching, but just need to be reminded, right? Psalm 66, 17 through 20. Let me read that to you. Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. If you're righteous, if you're serving the Lord, you're doing everything you know to do is right, call on the Lord, and he hears you. Let's read that again. Come and hear all ye that fear God. And I will declare what he hath done for my soul. Now, he didn't, he didn't move mountains at that moment. He didn't part seas for me. He just simply heard me. And listen to the, the excitement in his voice. You know, I will declare what he hath done for my soul. I cried unto him with my mouth, and he was extolled with my tongue. He was lifted up. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But God, but verily God hath heard me. He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Sometimes that's all the answer we get. It's just that he hears us. But that should be enough. It's enough that he hears me. Praise the Lord. While those in the world want men to see and hear them, while they esteem the ears of men high above the ear of God, I will take full advantage of the privilege I am afforded by knowing him, won't you? Micah was confident in this, and you and I can be as well. He said, my God will hear me. And it would be good for us to add this to our prayer lives. God, I know you hear me. That confidence. God, I know that you hear me. Amen. Moving on to verse 8. Verse 7's address to God. Verse 8, we find Micah changing his address, his attention from a holy God to a wicked opponent. He makes this statement, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. How many of you know that the same fervency and the same assurance that we pray to our God we can use that same fervency and assurance in speaking to our adversary. Micah prayed to God, and he spoke to his enemy. 
His statement was something along this line, don't get happy just yet, devil. Don't plan to celebrate over my demise. While others around me are serving you and worshiping you, don't rejoice over me as if I'm going to do the same. Amen? I don't intend for the devil to have one moment of rejoicing over my defeat. Do you? Sometimes I'd like to just make it through a battle or trial just to spite him. I don't want him to get an idea that he can shout the victory over my soul. I belong to God. Amen? You belong to God. I made up my mind a long time ago, and though all hell assail me, I shall not be moved. Amen? In verse 8, Micah tells his adversary, the adversary of God's people as a whole, Rejoice not over me. When I fall, I shall arise. When I fall is not a statement of if, but when. Micah doesn't claim to be perfect or as when one boasting as if he has arrived, but rather quite the opposite. Micah states it personally, when I fall. Though the perception of a newcomer or visitor might be that of perfection, none of us could ever claim that as our testimony. We have all made mistakes in our walk with God. We have all come short of the glory of God. We have all had to ask for forgiveness, restoration, and a fresh cleansing, a covering of the blood of Jesus along the way. Amen? Both hands raised. Yes. Amen? After salvation, a pursuit of God must ensue. A hunger for righteousness, as mentioned in Matthew 5 and 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled becomes a way of life after we get saved and a seeking after things which are above and not the things of the earth begins to be cultivated and nurtured sin is left behind sin is defeated amen sin does not reign have the throne of our mortal bodies we are not servants unto sin but unto righteousness yet the flesh still exists and the flesh is still our skin tent and the war with it and the war with the adversary rages and though we do live our lives to please the one who loved us and gave his life for us, the simple fact is we can sin against God after salvation. We can fall. 1 John 2 and 1 says, My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, this is where we get into this part, and if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Micah makes this statement, When? I fall as a man who is serving God but knows his own frailty and the frailty of even those among him who were the righteous remnant of that day, whom I believe he's also speaking for in this moment. But I'm so thankful that his sentence isn't over. I'm so thankful what comes next. I shall arise. But before we go there fully, we must first address the small little punctuation mark that lies between because it has a lot to say. The comma placed here after the statement, when I fall, it is a place where choices are made. That little comma, when I fall, that comma is a place where choices are made. I stay down or I get up. I stay here a while or I stay here just a moment. That comma is a perfect place for a pity party, cry over spilled milk, wallow in our own inadequacies, which of which there are plenty, and especially in my book. This is a place where the devil does his best work at this comma. He beats us up here like a boxer with a punching bag, making us think we're the only ones who've ever done this, replaying our fall over and over again, pressing. I see some heads nodding. Y'all know y'all feel the same. You've been there. Pressing, pushing us to stay down. But this comma, I'm so glad to report, is simply but God, right there in that comma, who the Bible says is rich in mercy. The comma is where he does his best potter and clay work. The comma doesn't take him off guard. The comma is where he runs to meet us. Amen? How many of you know names in biblical times meant a whole lot? You know, we name our kids today based on a sound or or maybe a family name. It's not really the meaning of the name. Uh, Maybe that's kind of an afterthought sometimes. But the meaning of biblical names were heavily looked to uh, and well thought out. The meaning of Micah's name happens to be a question. It is, who is like God? And it is no coincidence that the own meaning of his name is stated a further down in this chapter in verses 18 and 19. Let me go back to the book of Micah. I didn't mark it so I could go back to it. Hang on. 
Oh, yes, I did. In Micah 7, you know, we're talking about this comma, but God right here in this comma. And his, his name means um, who is like God. And in Micah 7, uh, verses 18 and 19, he says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. It is no mystery or hidden trait of God. He delighteth in mercy. His compassions fail not. His mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness, right? Yesterday's gone. The comma is not where we stay, where we take up residence. If we happen to find ourselves there, make sure it's a short visit. Call on and rest in his mercy and his compassion, for our God will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55 and 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him, upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. The comma has been dealt with in Micah's life. And the last portion of this statement takes center stage. I shall arise. Proverbs 24 and 16 says, For a just man, a just man, falleth seven times and riseth again. Riseth up again. Things happen. Situations happen. We fall. We falter. But this is where we make a decision. And this is where God meets us. He's not there to push us down to hold us under the water till we drown. He's there willing and able, more than able, to lift us up, pull us out, and give us a fresh start. We don't have to stay in that comma, when I fall, I shall arise. Amen? Um, it's not that we fall, it's that we arise. We're not going to focus on the fall, but we get back up. This testimony of Micah's is not exclusively his. Men and women the likes of which are some of the Bible's best examples, sharing this, yes, I fell, but yes, I got up experience. Jonah was disobedient about going to Nineveh as commanded by God. His comma lasted a little while and involved a three-day stint in a whale's belly, but he soon found himself preaching on the streets of Nineveh. His soul so personally full of God's mercy, I believe his message was more heartfelt more passionate than it ever could have been if he had not known him, himself personally about rising again. David was the pursuer of a roof, rooftop bather. Instead of pursuing his enemy on the battlefield, his fall was immediate and complicated. His comma would have been his stopping point had he not gotten a visit from the man of God, Nathan. Let us not forget that God's mercy will most likely involve one of those in our own story should we find ourselves looking up from a fall. After a bold proclamation of his willingness to die alongside Jesus, Peter never had time to remove his foot from his mouth before he fell from grace. Broken and humiliated, he fled from the scene of our Lord's crucifixion, the cock's crow still echoing in his ears. His comma lasted around three days. Getting back up was easy to do when the one he betrayed sought him out there on that shoreline. Who can resist a Savior who comes to where you are and reminds you of your love for him and that there is a work for you to do? Amen? Others fell who never stood again. What a sad testimony. Judas, King Saul, we don't read of Solomon making things right. Let each of us be determined, if you have fallen, to get back up. The Hebrew word for arise, there in that verse in uh, Micah 7 and 8, it means just that. It means get up. That's the whole point and whole title of the, of the lesson. Get up. Repent. Start over. Give your life back to the Lord. Uh, we have just a minute. I'm, I'm going to share this with you. Years ago when Pastor and I, uh, of course, we got saved when we were young. He, he got back in church, and he testifies of that uh, when he was around I don't know, we were in our 20s, maybe 20 years old. And I reluctantly came along. I, I rededicated my life. I never got sanctified, really, and full of the Holy Ghost. And 
we served the Lord for a time together. He got in there and got, he was Sunday school superintendent doing all of that. And I was kind of part of the whole resistance of going back into church. He never tells that part. <laughs> Thankfully, he's nice to me, but I kind of resisted all that. And I was part of him being led away from the Lord. We just kind of fell out of church. And for years, uh, we didn't serve the Lord. Um, we backslid. And when pastor came, when he wasn't pastor then, but when he came back to the Lord, he came back first. And he came back with a, a desire and a, and a gumption. And I was, I was much not like that. I was like, really? You know, I just was. I was very resistant because I knew the life that God was calling me to live, and I resisted it. And I remember, I do remember during the revival um, that he was having over here in this old building, and I was coming to church. I was, I was doing what I knew to do right, but I knew I really needed to rededicate myself. I just needed to get in there. And it wasn't a, you know, some people have those moments where, and Pastor, you know, he testifies of his. He went down a center, and came, of course I did too, but I mean, went down going straight to hell and got up going straight to heaven. And there was this earth-shattering move of the Lord, it really was, when he got saved. Mine was not like that. I came down to the, the altar. Other people were praying. And for all looks and, and appearances of things, I was, I was doing right. And I guess in some ways I was trying to do it on my own. But I got in that altar. I don't think anybody prayed with me. I just rededicated myself to the Lord. There in that place of a comma, I had fallen, and I needed to get back up. God met me there. I went on to be sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Everybody's experience is different, but everybody's got to have that experience of getting back up. If you, are, if you have fallen, get back up and go forward for the Lord. It's so wonderful. I just love him. Don't you love him? Let's just give him a hand clap of praise. I love him. He's so good to us. Looking forward to what the Lord's going to do in the service this morning. Let's get in there and have church together. I love y'all. Praise the Lord. No one knew how long I was feeling. And the emptiness I tried so hard to hide Though I laughed and said my life was fine without you I was covering up the secret tears I cried Then one day someone told me of your mercy and the love you showed on a hill called Calvary There you died and purchased my redemption When you broke sin's power and set my spirit free I'm amazed that you love me It's true, there have been days when I failed you. Lord, you know the many times I've gone astray. But I've learned your love is stronger than my weakness. And your ear is 
eyes open every time I pray. No one else has ever cared for me like you, Lord. Other friends can never be as close to me. I'm not afraid to face the problems of tomorrow. South Asheboro Church of God. So good to see you in God's house today. Good to have all of our visitors. Good to have uh, Jean Guerin. She's my first cousin. Her son, James Payne. My second cousin. Good to have them. Good to have uh, Sheila and Jackson with us today. Good to have uh, Brian, Felicia, Mackenzie, Courtney, and Becky. Good to have uh, each and every one of you. I'm glad you're in the house of the Lord today. Oh, good to have Amanda. She's with us again today. Praise God. Uh, but I'm glad God's here today. I'm glad he's here, and he's here to help us with whatever we have need of. Just call upon him. I enjoyed that Sunday school lesson. It's to trust in God. That's what the whole lesson was about, trusting in God, waiting on him. Trust him, wait on him. You know, he will meet our needs. Uh, also, we had a uh, birthday uh, yesterday, Sister Albright, so she's going to play for her own birthday. So let's stand and sing happy birthday to Sister Albright. Seven. Seven. Seven years old, right? Seven, yeah. Turn it backwards. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Happy birthday. Any anniversary Excuse since me. last Sunday? That's all right. Anybody else had a birthday that I don't know about? Okay. Well, go get him. Who? You come up here and stand and run to him. Stand that way. Who, who, who had a birthday? Anniversary, Scott Nash. Oh, Scott, Scott Nash, yes. Scott Nash. Where's he at? He's in here. 
Okay, Scott and Ashley had an anniversary of this thing. Happy anniversary to them. Happy anniversary to you. Also, today is Reformation Sunday. And what this is, we're going to be have receiving an uh, offering a little bit later. I'll be reading something, but it's, uh, we have received a special offering for retired ministers and widows. That this money will go to them. Uh, you know, they've uh, labored during their lives. You know, preaching the gospel. They've retired, and the you know the widows of the you know, ministers. And we want to bless them today. So a little bit later, we'll be having a Reformation Sunday offering. And I'll read uh, something here before we have that. Uh, but as we got to pray today, we've got a lot to pray about. Uh, let's continue to pray for Dean Callahan. This is Sister Tina's dad. He's back in the hospital. His ammonium levels are very high. He had a stent put in to help take care of some problems he was having, but it seems like that that's not really helping him a lot, so he's had a lot of problems. But God's able to reach down and touch him and heal him today. So let's pray for Dean and pray for Sister Tina and uh, Kathy today. Also, let's uh, continue praying for Sister Sandra's healing. Continue praying for Sister Ball's healing. Uh, Brother uh, Benny told me that uh, she texted and said she's having some pain in her tendon in her knee and it's preventing her from being able to walk and get back to church. But pray that God will remove that pain in that tendon and she'll be able to get back and get back to church. We miss her and Brother Ball in church. Let's continue praying and uplifting Brother Keith Speed, uh, you know, a minister. He's an evangelist that got cancer, that uh, we, God will touch him and heal him. Also, Pastor Key's wife, she has cancer. Let's remember Pastor Key's wife today. I also pray for James Payne. Uh, he's here today. I'm glad he's here. He's got a blood clot in his knee, and he needs God to remove that blood clot. You know, there's medications he can take, but it's so expensive. But, you know, God's able to reach down today, James, and touch you in your body and heal you today and remove that blood clot. Also, let's uh, pray for Alice Turner. She's suffering from effects from COVID. Pray for Betty Small and jo Joanne Sanders for healing. Also pray, pray for Teresa, Sister Judy's daughter. She needs a physical and spiritual touch today. Let's pray for her. Does anybody else have a prayer request that wasn't mentioned? Yes, pray, pray for Brother Benny's brother Carl. He uh, needs a touch in his body, having kidney failure. The God will reach down and touch him and heal him. Anybody else? Yes, let's remember Brother and Sister Milliken in prayer today. Yes, remember the special request. Let's stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Yes. His name's John. Remember John, it's a homeless man that Sister Alder's giving him a request for. Remember Brother Mike Woolard in prayer. He's having some health issues. Touch, God will touch him today. Okay, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Precious Heavenly Father, we come to you today. We thank you. We praise you. We love you, Lord God. We give you your mercy and love. We thank you, Lord, for every time. Lord God, we come down, Lord God. Lord, you heard all these prayer requests. There's maybe seen many, Lord God. Just, the Lord, there's nothing for you, Lord God. Is there anything too hard for God? No, there's not. Lord, I ask God to reach down today. Touch James Mayne, Lord God. Just touch him in his body, Lord God. Remove that blood clot today, Lord God. Lord, I ask God to touch him in his Lord, 
Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory in this. What does people glory in today? Jeremiah, uh, the ninth chapter, verses 23 and 24 said, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understand and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exerciseth love and kindness, judgment and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So let's glory in the Lord today. Uh, this time we're going to receive our tithe and offering. And then after that, we're going to, we'll, I'll read this and then we'll receive the Reformation Sunday offering. So this will be our tithes and offerings. We'll get our usher come at this time. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Brother Matthew, would you pray with us time of worship? Thank you, Lord. Amen. It's the light of my You want me to read this now, brother? Okay. All right. Uh, it says, Dear Western North Carolina Pastor, Christian Greenness from the State Office. Sunday, October 30th is designated as Reformation Sunday, the time when we turn our hearts to the fathers and mothers of our movement. As you are aware, many states do not have the same resources or opportunities to bless their retired ministers as w does Western North Carolina. That's why every year, the last Sunday of October is designated as Reformation Sunday, and you are asked to receive a special offering for our retired ministers and widows who live across the United States. This offering goes to Cleveland and is used to bless retired ministers or widows who are experiencing financial difficulties and or medical hardships, including those in Western North Carolina. In recent years, the amount has been significantly lower due to the economy and lack of giving by the churches. Would you consider receiving a special offering just for this cause on uh, October the 30th, Reformation Sunday? You can either send it to the state office or the international office with uh, your report for October. If you need to receive your regular tithes and offerings first, that's fine, but at least give the congregation a chance to bless those, these men and women of God who have been pioneers of the faith. You may also want to share the promotional video link attached. Many of your pastor congregations you did not win in buildings you did not build but are building on the foundation of uh, the others have laid. As you bless them, I believe you will be blessed. Thanks for your assistance in this worthy project. 100% of this offering goes directly to retired ministers and widows who are going through financial difficult financial times in their lives. In his service, Church of God Executive at Office of Western North Carolina, Kip A. Box. So at this time, you want to have to receive the offering, go ahead and receive it. We'll watch, watch the video, and then we'll receive the offering.
my heart, I told the Lord I would be willing to be a preacher. We started the church. We had been called to the ministry at age 19. I was called into the ministry while I was at Lee. In my junior year, I was going to go to the Philadelphia area. We got saved in the ministry to the military in uh, Kaiserslautern, Germany. So we ended up going to San Angelo, Texas and ministered there for 18 years. Didn't build a big church, but I believe we built the kingdom. God really got a hold of my heart. I told the Lord I would be willing to be a preacher. We started the church, we pioneered it from scratch, and we spent 43 years there. So Lord, the Lord has blessed us in this way, and my husband passed away. We pastored almost 28 years. I've just kept on serving the Lord, going forward with the Lord. In 2009, my wife got cancer, and so we moved to Cleveland to live with our son. Five months, month into retirement, she died. And sometimes, uh, you know, we feel like we're not included in the ministry anymore. But just the fact that our church remembers us and our labors through the years, sometimes we feel like we're the forgotten people. Well, it, it's very uh, special to me uh, each year to uh, receive a, a nice card from the state office with that offering. With my father, I can still remember him saying, son, that offering that I received from uh, general offices sure did help this year. And it's a blessing to me. So I think it's very important to uh, honor the retired ministers and their widows as well. And uh, so that the Lord will bless you as the word tells you. I very much appreciate the Church of God and the emphasis that it puts on taking care and taking care of our retired ministers and just letting them know they're not forgotten, they're remembered, and they're appreciated. You know, as retired ministers, we sometimes feel like we're forgotten, though we know we're not, you know, but the offering that you give will be a real blessing. It's not just the money, but the fact that you remember and the, you that give, let it be known that all of us that receive it, we really do appreciate it. It's been a great blessing to me and just the encouragement that I received from the Church of God, that meant so much to me. And I love the Church of God and um, I'm just thankful. October 30th is a very special Sunday because that is Reformation Sunday. And throughout North America, we celebrate our retired ministers. And we ask every church on Reformation Sunday to receive a special love gift, a special love offering that can be sent to our retired ministers at Christmas time. One of my favorite things to do at the beginning of every new year is to come in from the holiday and to read my mail. And I'm always blessed when I go through card after card and letter after letter from retired ministers who have been so blessed by the gifts that you send in. Let me ask you to do your very best so that we can say to these men and women who have paved the way for all of us, thank you, and what a special time to say it, Christmas time. I look forward to hearing from you. Pastor, do your best and give your church an opportunity on Reformation Sunday, October 30th. I think they said enough, you know, that, uh, you know, they've paved the way, they've worked, you know, we're like the letter said, you know, we're in buildings that we didn't build, you know, uh, the church next door started, you know, I remember when the Church of God, it started out, the South Asheville Church of God started out in a little old trailer, a little old trailer, then it came to a bigger trailer, I think, and then to the block church, and now we're here, so God has blessed, but it's not because of what we've done, it's those who have worked before us, it's, it's a progression. So we want to take care of those who have paid, you know, paved the trail, so to speak. Okay. This time we'll get our ushers come back, and let's give a, a good special offering today to bless those ministers.
rock of ages, I know that he is able, mighty is he. I know my God can do it to him. There's nothing to it. I know he'll see me through it, sweet victory. Even when storms are raging, he is my rock of ages. I know that he is able, mighty is he. May God richly bless you through your faithfulness and giving. This time I have our youth choir come at this time and minister in song. Yes. God. It's worship with him.
Is that your desire today? Want more of God? It should be. We want more and more of God. Praise God. I appreciate these young youth, these young men and women that serving God, wanting more of God. Coming up here and singing and you know just worshiping God in song. Praise God. This time I'm going to turn the service to our pastor, Brother Sheldon. Give the Lord a good hand clap offering of praise this morning. Amen. That should be the desire of every child of God. We don't want to see how far away we can get from him and still go to heaven. I believe that we feel like the Apostle Paul, that we want to press our way in. Getting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before me. He said, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. There is a drift today in the church. There's a drift in this church age. We don't have to drift away. We can be steadfast and movable and always abounding in the work of God. Amen. Glad to see you in the house of God on this Sunday morning. I want you to give those young people a good hand of appreciation today. I'd rather see them in the house of God up on this platform trying to do something for the Lord than you not knowing where they are, them out there strung out on drugs somewhere, them hung over from a party last night. I'm glad they're in the house of God. Amen. I love our young people at this church. Praise God. Good to have you with us. I told Felicia and Brian, they came one service, came back the next, brought the whole family with them. Man, if we were doing pack a pew, they would win the turkey today. Anybody still remember that pack a pew? Isn't that right? Felicia and Brian, good to have you. Mackenzie, Courtney and Becky, and Sheila and Jackson. Glad to have that whole crowd back there. Thank you all for being with us in the house of God this morning. Good to have Jean Guerin. She's a nice lady. And she's been smiling the whole time she's been got here, been since she got here. I love her and appreciate her being with us this morning. Good to have her son James with us today. Been praying for him. He needs a touch in his body. And that God can heal. He still heals. Amen. We're glad to have them. I thought that was his daughter this morning, and uh, she got excited about that. We're glad they're in the house of God. Good to see all of you. I want to pray for those that are sick. Continue to pray for Sister Tina's dad. He is back in the hospital. She's there with him today. And uh, he needs much prayer. Amen. God can reach in that hospital and touch him and heal his body. And uh, he's a mighty big God. Praise the Lord. We're glad to have all of you. want to get in the word of God today. If you have your Bibles, Jeremiah chapter 7. I enjoyed Sister Shelton, the Sunday school lesson this morning. Bless my heart. Last evening, Jeremiah chapter 7, please. We'll begin reading in verse 1. Last evening, uh, I was upstairs in my room studying some more and um, praying over the message today. And downstairs, Sister Shelton was preparing her lesson, working on that for the day. And then down the hall in Anna Grace's room, Anna Grace was preparing. She told him, Sister Ashley and Brother Scott's class this morning. And I sat there just thanking the Lord how blessed I am. To have my family serving God and in church. And I thought here we are, all three of us on a Saturday night, making preparations to pour into you today with the word of God. And I just appreciate the blessing of the Lord. God's been good to our family. Glad to have all my children in the church serving God in every, some capacity or form in this church. And my son-in-laws and now those two grandbabies, uh, you know, they love to shout already. They're Pentecostal. They love to shout. Sometimes they get so happy they have to take them to the nursery. Amen. But I'm glad my family's in, in church serving God, trying to help people. That's what I pray. Lord, help our family to be a blessing to somebody else, to help somebody. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 7, we'll begin reading in verse 1. Let's pray. Father, thank you. We're blessed to be here this morning, God. We ask that you'll help us now for the next little while. Lord, we thank you for all the visitors that are here today. We love and appreciate every one of them. All the home folks this morning, God, we thank you for those that have joined with us online today. And We pray that you'll reach down in those homes or wherever they may be, God, and touch them and bless them this morning. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us. I thank you for the singing. 
Thank you for this youth choir and the great job they did here singing today for you. I pray that the hearts have been made ready for the word of God. And Lord, I just ask you now to convict today and let that river flow through this house, God. Let it draw to the altars this morning. I thank you for the preaching of the word of God. And I pray, God, that uh, there will be fruit around these altars from the preaching today. Uh, I pray for the anointing, God. I need that touch from heaven. I can't do anything without you. Uh, I need your help, God. Touch my mind. Uh, touch my mouth today, God. Let me speak only heavenly things. Uh, only from the word of God now. I pray, Lord, that you'll touch us and you'll help us now. You'll breathe upon us, dear Lord. And, Father, everything rendered, let it be for your glory and your praise and your honor. Everybody said amen. Raise your hands and thank him this morning. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. I do feel the Holy Ghost here this morning. Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 7. We'll begin reading in verse 1 today. The Bible says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, that is, the temple, and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. He said, stand there at the temple, and while my people go into the house of God to offer me some type of worship, to go through the religious routines, he said, you stand there and you tell them to amend your ways, to get things right with me. To make your way straight again. And then God gave a promise to them and he said, And I will cause you to dwell in this place. May God add his blessing to his red word this morning. Hallelujah. Brother Dean, you can bring me down just a little bit on this morning. Not a whole lot, just a little bit, please. I want to preach to you this morning as God's laid upon our heart. I struggle with this message. I fought with this message, but I believe I have the mind of Christ here today. Simply amend your ways and your doings. Amend your ways and your doings. Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet in the Word of God. Jeremiah's heart was broken because of the condition of Israel. When he looked around at God's people and he saw the place they had been, and now he sees the place where they are. Jeremiah's heart was overwhelmed. It was burdened. And Jeremiah, on more than one occasion, would weep openly for the people of God. In his day of ministry, he was one of the very few voices that continually spoke the truth about God to the people of God. You read the history here in the book of Jeremiah. Most of the teachers of that day most of the preachers of that day had been caught up in sin. They'd got entangled with things in that world. And I tell you, it ought not to ever be with a man of God. I said, a man of God ought not to ever be entangled with the things of this world. The teachers of Israel had been caught up in sin. They were guilty now of lying to the people about their true condition. They failed to warn them of the dire consequences of sin uh, and to continue in that sinful lifestyle. But Jeremiah was a man of God, and Jeremiah stood true uh, to the truth of God's Word. The Bible teaches us that because of his stand for the truth, uh, he was not received well in that day uh, because the people in Jeremiah's day, uh, they simply did not want to hear the truth. They didn't want to know that what they were doing was wrong. They didn't want anybody to say to them that the path that you're on is the wrong path. They didn't want a preacher to tell them that you're wrong in the way that you're living. They didn't hear, want to hear the words of this prophet of doom. Just like in Isaiah's day, they wanted to hear smooth things and not right things. 
But yet in the midst of this, Jeremiah stood up and Jeremiah spoke the truth of God's word to them. I want you to notice here this morning that all that Jeremiah said was spoken directly to God's own people. He said here in verses 1 and 2, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in all at these gates uh, to worship the Lord. Jeremiah was not speaking to the Gentile nations. He was not speaking to an idolatrous nation. He was not speaking to those people who had no knowledge of God. But Jeremiah was preaching to a people uh, who, who was in that temple there, supposed to be the people of God. He was preaching to a people that were supposed to love God. People that were supposed to be faithful to God. People that were supposed to be serving the Lord. He was preaching to a people who were not supposed to be under the judgment of God or under the condemnation of God, but people that were supposed to be under the favor of the Lord because of their faithfulness to Him. The Bible tells us those who are unbelievers are the ones who are condemned. John 3 and 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I want to tell you here this morning that God's heart uh, is not set upon condemning uh, mankind, uh, but God's heart is set upon saving mankind. The Bible said in John 3, 16 and 17, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, uh, but should have everlasting life. In verse 17, he said, For God sent not his Son uh, into the world to condemn the world, uh, but that the world through him, through Jesus Christ, might be saved. It is not God's will uh, that all men uh, should die and go to hell. It is God's will that every man, woman, boy, and girl uh, should fall upon their face in repentance before God uh, and receive this gift uh, of salvation. Somebody say amen to him today. It's not God's will that any be lost, that any perish, that any die and go to that awful place of hell. God did not create man in his own image uh, just to lose man to the clutches of sin uh, and the clutches of the devil. God did not create those eternal fires of judgment uh, there in the beginning for the souls of men, uh, but for that those rebellious angels uh, and that devil. I'm telling you here this morning, uh, if any person dies and go to hell, and you will, uh, if you die lost without Jesus Christ, uh, Amen. If any person dies and goes to hell, uh, they'll go back there by their own choice, uh, by their own choosing, uh, and by their neglect of this great salvation uh, that God has provided to all uh, through his son Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't know how you feel about it, uh, but I'm glad to have this gift of salvation. Uh, I'm glad that my name is written uh, in the Lamb's book of life. Uh, I'm glad I'm not a sinner any longer but I've been saved by the grace of God and now we're on our way to heaven and we're so glad for the blessings of the Lord in our life hallelujah to God if you die and go to hell it'll be because you chose that because you neglected the gift that God is offering to mankind every person that dies and goes to hell that was not God's will. That was their choice. God is still the same God that he was in the days of Jeremiah. His love has not abated. He's still long-suffering in waiting for the response of his people. Amen. God's patient. He's a long-suffering God. Amen. God, he wants us to respond to his word. He wants us to respond to His Spirit. 
He wants us to respond by faith. He wants us to get totally and wholly right with him. He wants us to be sold out and surrendered to him. He wants us to love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, body, and strength with all that we are. God is a jealous God. His very first commandment is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God's not going to share you or me with this world. He wants all or nothing. He, man, God is waiting patiently for you and I to respond to him, to come to him, and to give him our everything. I'm telling you here this morning that when we lived in sin, we gave the devil everything that we had. We didn't question him. We simply obeyed him. But when we come to Jesus Christ and we surrender our hearts to him, he's not just going to be our Savior to deliver us out of the muck and the mire. He's going to be the Lord over all that we are. Somebody ought to shout amen today. I'm telling you, God wants every part of you. He wants you to be holy and fully surrendered to him and live your life for him somebody say amen he is long suffering in waiting for a response from his people but we also know that God's righteous judgments are just the same as well God is not going to allow sin to continue among that lost and sinful world out there there's going to come a day that God uh, is going to judge the wickedness uh, of mankind. The Bible said in Ezekiel 18 and 20, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Romans 6 and 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. God's not going to let the United States of America to continue in this downward spiral that we're in. He's not going to let this country continue uh, to, to, to exalt sin and wickedness. Uh, God's going to judge it. I said God uh, is going to judge it. Uh, but it goes deeper than that. God is not going to continue to allow sin uh, among his people uh, in the church. Can you say amen? The Bible said in 2 Timothy 2 and 19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of the Lord uh, depart from iniquity. There are people that say today, uh, I can be saved and still practice sin daily. I would say to you, sir, uh, you need to get born again. Uh, you need to get washed by the blood uh, because those who've been born again, uh, they get out of the sin practicing business. Uh, you don't continue in that sinful lifestyle. The Bible said if you name Jesus Christ, uh, then stop sinning. Depart from your iniquities. First Peter 4 and 17 says, for the time has come that judgment uh, must begin at the house of God. He didn't say the bar room or the crack house. Uh, he didn't say that nightclub. Uh, he said judgment must begin first uh, at the house of God. And if it first begin in us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? God's not going to let sin get by in any form uh, and any fashion. God is going to judge the sins of mankind. Does it matter whether you attend church or not? If you've got sin in your life, it's going to be judged by God. Some men's sins go before them and others follow after. If you get washed by the blood, your sins will go ahead of you. They'll be forgiven. They'll be washed away. But if you don't repent of your sins, your sins are going to follow you straight to the judgment throne of God. And there you will give an account for those sins against God. If God were to allow his people to continue in sin and to not bring judgment upon the house of God, then God would have to turn back the pages of history. He'd have to raise up every one of those souls of Israel who died lost without God in those days because they turned their backs on God. He would have to apologize to them for being an unjust God. 
But the Bible said that God is the same yesterday, uh, today, and forever. God was just in those days, uh, and God is still just uh, in his judgment in our day. Somebody give him a hand of praise today. Hallelujah to God. Here he is. God's trying to reach out to his wayward people. People, God told Jeremiah, stand at the gate of the temple. Stand there at the church and say to this people, in verse 3, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Here we find that God's people were in the temple. They're worshiping him. They're making the sacrifices. They're trying to do what the law says, but yet God makes it clear that they have sin in their hearts. They're going through the routines of religion. They're going through the motions of what they've learned how to do, but yet they had not been faithful to God. They're worshiping him in the temple uh, on Sunday. uh, But when they go out of that temple, uh, they're worshiping idols out there in that world. Say amen. They're not being true to God. They're hypocriting around. They're pretending to be something in the temple uh, and something altogether else out there in that world. In other words, their hearts are not right with God. Amen. The priests may not know it. Uh, Their family may not know it. uh, But God sees everything. Uh, He knows the evil and the good. Uh, There is nothing that escapes the eyes of God Almighty. Uh, Doesn't matter how they do it in the church. Uh, Doesn't matter how well they know the songs. Uh, How well they can teach from that Bible. Uh, How well they can preach. Uh, How they clap. How they shout. How they dance. Uh, God looks directly at the heart. Uh, For man looks on the outward. Uh, But God looks at the heart. uh, And God knows where his people is. When he looked at that congregation. uh, He said your hearts are not right with me. He told Jeremiah, he said, tell them to amend your ways and your doings. In other words, get everything right. Get it right between man and God. Get it right between man and man. Say man to me. The one commentator said it this way. I read this last evening. He said the people were breaking God's laws and committing all kinds of sins. Then on the Sabbath, the day of worship, they came to the temple with the idea that they were acceptable before God. But God said to them, amend your ways and your doings. In other words, repent of your sins against me. Get it right. And then God tells them, if they will repent, God will be merciful to them and God will forgive them of their sins against him. Here we see the great love of God reaching out to a wayward people who have sinned and strayed from him. The Bible said in 2 Peter 3 and 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. First John 1 and 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all right unrighteousness. Here we see the tremendous value that God places upon the soul of each and every person. God could have let them continue on in their wayward paths. God could continue to let them go follow that downward path. But God touched the heart of Jeremiah and said, Go tell this wayward people that you need to repent. Go tell these sinful people that you need to fall on your face. Go tell this backslidden people that you need to return to me. Get it under the blood and begin to serve me again. And if you do that, I'll be merciful to you. I'll forgive you of all of your sins. Hallelujah to God. God 
God shows us his love for people. God shows us how he tries to reach out to those that are wayward, those that forsaken him, and those that are on the wrong path. I believe that God's still trying to reach out to wayward people today. Just like Jeremiah stood at the temple uh, preaching the word of God. Amen. God's burnt this message in my heart for this congregation today. Amen. I believe that there are people in this house this morning that love God with all of your heart. I believe there's people in this house who are sold out to the Lord. People who are blood washed. Uh, people who live it right. Uh, people who walk it right. Uh, who talk it right. Uh, who are in the right relationship with the Lord. That's you. You ought to nod your head and say amen to me. I believe there's some folks under the sound of my voice that you are faithful in prayer, that you are faithful in the order, uh, that you are faithful to the Word of God. You're faithful when it comes to church attendance. You're faithful when it comes to living right. You're faithful when it comes to giving and tithing. You're faithful to live a holy life. Uh, you, you, you come to a place in your life when you walk with God is such uh, that you have denied yourself uh, and you've taken up your cross uh, and you're following the Lord uh, each and every day. Uh, I tell you, that's where we ought to all be. Uh, if we're going to name the name of the Lord, uh, then we ought to leave this world behind. Uh, we ought to leave sin behind. Uh, we ought to leave the lukewarm lifestyle behind. Uh, we ought to not drift away from the Lord, uh, but we ought to press our way into Him. Uh, and if we ever drawn near to God uh, we ought to draw nigh to him now raise your hands and praise him today hallelujah to God there's some of you that love the Lord I don't have any doubt about that I've been pastoring here a long time and some of you have been here a long time that doesn't have anything to do with your relationship and where you are with God and you can be in church all your life and still die lost and go to hell when you breathe your final breath. There are people in this house that love the Lord, that you serve Him, uh, that you're faithful to Him. Uh, he is your everything. You love Him with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, uh, your body, and your strength. Amen. You are committed to Him in every way. And you have decided you're going to follow Jesus uh, and you're not going to let anybody uh, or anything cause you to miss that rapture. Uh, you're not going to let anybody or anything. Uh, I don't care if you've been hurt. Uh, I don't care if you've been wounded. Uh, I don't care if you've been trampled upon. Uh, you're not going to let anything keep you down. Uh, you're going to rise back up uh, and you're going to keep on walking uh, with the King of Kings uh, and the Lord of Lords uh, because you know... Uh, that heaven is closer uh, now than it's ever been uh, and you want to make heaven your home. Uh, I'm convinced that there's some people under the sound of my voice that this is the way that you live. And if you continue in that path, you're going to make it to heaven when you leave this life. But I also know that there are people in this house today who are not as close to the heart of God as you know that you ought to be. I preached all this to get to this place right here this morning. There are some folks under the sound of my voice this morning who you know that you're not walking with God the way that you should be. You know that you're not as close to the Lord right now as you one time were. You know there were days gone by uh, when you were close, your heart was tender uh, before God. You loved his house. Uh, you loved the preaching of the word. Uh, you loved to hear the songs of Zion. Uh, you loved uh, to walk with God. You loved the altar. Uh, you loved the word. Uh, you loved to live holy before the Lord. Uh, but something in your life, somewhere in that journey, uh, you found yourself in a drift uh, away from God. You're not as faithful to the house of God as you were. You're not as faithful to the word of God as you one time were. You're not as faithful to that altar. You're not as faithful in your relationship. 
relationship uh, with God. I, I want to tell you here this morning, I, I didn't come to beat you up or to be ugly to you. Uh, hey man, God loves you enough uh, and God cares about you enough uh, to try to talk to you through the word today, uh, to try to deal with your heart uh, through his spirit uh, that it's time for you to amend your ways uh, and your doings uh, and get right with God. Come back uh, to a right relationship uh, with the Lord. And if you do that, uh, God's going to forgive you. Uh, God's going to wash you. Uh, God's going to cleanse you. Uh, and you can leave this house today uh, with a joy in your heart uh, that I'm ready for heaven. Uh, I'm ready to meet the Lord. There are folks under the sound of my voice this morning that you've allowed things of life to entangle you. Things that you know that you shouldn't let entangle you. You've been distracted in the journey. Things that you've allowed to rob you of your time in prayer with God. Things that you've allowed to rob you of that time and that word of God. Your commitment to Him, your faithfulness to Him. Amen. Just like Jeremiah stood there outside that temple while those people were going into church to worship, he stood there preaching on the way into them that you got to get it right. Today you got to amend your ways. You've got to amend your doings. When they come back out of the service feeling good about what they had done, about the offerings they'd given, Jeremiah standing there, you got to make it right with. God. You got to amend your ways. You got to amend your doings. If you do that, God's going to forgive you. God's going to be merciful to you. But if you refuse, God's going to judge you in your sin. Jeremiah knew that the way they went in the church and what they offered worship, that when they left that temple, they were going to go right back out to idolatry. Right back out to sin. Right back out to unfaithfulness to God. You see, you might it might escape the eyes of the pastor. Sometimes it don't. It might escape the eyes of your family. Sometimes it don't. But God looks right down directly into our hearts. And God knows what we are before him. And some of you here today, you've come in this house and you've tried to blend in with everybody else. You've tried to act like everything's all right. You've nodded your head and clapped your hands on cue. You've said amen when the preacher says to say amen. Amen. But God looks right at our heart. And he knows whether I've been faithful to him or not. He knows where I am. And you know where you are. I said you know where you are today. You know whether you've lived right this week. You know whether you've been faithful to God. You know whether you've given him everything that he requires of us. What does he require of me? He requires everything of me. He requires my heart, my mind, this body, this tabernacle. He requires it all. He requires my faithfulness and my commitment. If you've slipped, if you've fallen, God will take you back up. God will get you out of that place but you got to repent of it you got to get it under the blood and you got to recommit and rededicate yourself to him Jeremiah said you're going to go in this church today but God sees your heart and your heart's not right with me there are some of you that's come in this house this morning. God has seen the drift in your life. God knows about those hidden sins. God knows about those secret places that you think nobody else knows about. God sees what your eyes see and what they watch, and he knows what your ears hear and what they listen to. He knows every time you miss time in his word he knows every time you miss that time to pray he knows when you do what you're not supposed to be God knows it all 
God keeps a perfect record. You have the appearance everything's okay. And you act like there's nothing wrong. And you just try to fit in with everybody else in the church so that you don't seem out of place so it doesn't seem obvious. But God looks directly at your heart. And God is saying to this congregation that you need to amend your ways. And you need to amend your doings. And you need to get it right with God. One more time. The great shepherd's calling you by name. One more time, the voice of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I don't know God's timetable for my life or your life. But just maybe this could be God's final call to your heart to turn back to Him in repentance. You've neglected Him. You've neglected His Word. You've neglected His order. You've neglected His commands to live holy. You've neglected the command to serve Him with all that you are. This may be your final call to cut ties with those hidden and secret sins. This may be the time that God gives you to get things wholly right with Him. Today may be your final call to amend your ways and your doings before God. I don't know how long God will continue to call to repentance. I don't know how long God's going to continue to call people to turn back to Him. I don't know how long God will continue to allow people that's known Him and loved Him to just to continue to drift and get farther and farther away from Him until one day you wake up and you realize you've lost your desire. When you lose your desire for God, you've lost it. I said, you've lost it. When you lose your desire to pray, when you lose your desire for the Bible, you, desire, you lose your desire for those things, you lose your desire to church, and then going to church will just be a burden. It'll be a dread. It'll be just something I got to get over with today. I got to get it behind me so I can get about doing what I really want to do for the day. God told those people who were going into his house through Jeremiah, Amend your ways. Get right with God. You can be religious and be lost. But in that relationship with Jesus, if you'll walk in a relationship with Him, you're going to be saved from the judgment, destruction that's coming upon this old world. Everybody stand, please. Sister Albright, come play softly. The days of Jeremiah, the people resisted, and God judged those people, and many of them died without God. They died lost in that condition. They had everything they needed to serve God. How much more do we have today? They had everything they needed on that side of the cross. How much more do we have on this side of the cross? We have the blood. We have the Spirit of God to live in us. We have the Word of God. We have preachers that will preach the Word of God. Teachers that will teach the Word of God. Most every home has a copy, at least one copy of this book. I wonder how long it's been since you've cracked it open. I wonder how long it's been since you've knelt there at an altar in your home and really sought God. Jeremiah said, As they come into the church, today's the day to get right with God. Today's the day to amend your ways and your doings and get everything right with God. Everybody close your head and bow your eyes. There's going to come a day when the call to be part of this true body of Christ is going to come to an end. The church is going to be gone and left behind will be those who have rejected God, those who were not faithful to Him. They're going to be left to a world of delusions and lies and deception. 
where there's going to be very little hope of survival. Somebody said, well, preacher, if I, get, if I miss the rapture for some reason, I'm hearing that tribulation, I'll get right with them. I say to you, you won't. Because if you can't live for God now, how in the world are you going to live for God in that time? If you can't live for Him now. Somebody said, I'd die for Him, Brother Shelton. You won't die for Him because you won't have to live for Him. God wants our whole heart, folks. God's getting His church ready for the rapture. Are you part of that church? God loves you too much to allow you to go into judgment without giving you the opportunity to turn it around. God calling out to you today. I want you to pray, saints of God. I'd much rather come in here and preach try to make you shout this morning. But we've got to get it right. God's love is not abated toward us. God cares about you. And he sent this old preacher boy this morning to tell you that he loves you, and that he cares about you. And if you'll come to him and amend your ways, he's going to be faithful to forgive you. You may have fallen, but you're going to rise again. Maybe you've been hurt. Maybe you've been wounded. Maybe you got distracted. Whatever the cause, it matters not to God. What matters is, is that the Spirit of God's trying to reach out to you today. God's trying to reach you through His Word because He loves you that much. If that's you this morning, if you're here, you say, Brother Shelton, God's been talking to me. I want you to come to these altars today. We'll pray with you. We've got folks that will love you and pray with you.